so much for welcoming me. Uh, before I go ahead and get started, I would like to thank Mr. Abdul Manaim for inviting me and uh, he took the time. We had several meetings just to make sure everything is running smoothly. And then I would like to thank each one of you for joining us today. So the plan is I'm gonna take you guys on a virtual field trip to the Paradox Basin. But as you said, before that, we'll do a quick introduction on my part and uh, then we'll, we'll get into it. So I started Applied Stratigraphics in 2012 and um, Alhamdulillah in that since 2012 until now, we have grown, we have about 56 different clients worldwide. And uh, this includes, you know, I took Metco's logo and I blew it up on top because when I saw the list, I saw a whole lot of people from Metco. Yeah. And I was this, was, this was actually, it was a pleasant surprise because I have taught a lot of geoscientists from Metco before, but it has always been in Indonesia. Yeah. So we, I've taught courses in, in, um, in Bandung, in Yogyakarta, in Bali, and uh, every time I've taught courses in Indonesia, we have a whole bunch of people from Metco in there. So it's, it's yeah. nice to see so many people from that company today. Yeah. It's a pleasant surprise. But, um, but yeah, we started and now we've got 56 clients. So these are companies that I have either directly done consulting work for or I have trained their geoscientists at some point. And today, the reason I'm talking to you about uh, the Paradox Basin is I have a lot of experience there. And hopefully by the end of the presentation today, I'm hoping that what you will, guys will realize is that the Paradox Basin is actually a very useful place and a very good analog for people working in Oman on the Gharif. So here's the plan for today. I'm gonna briefly, I've already introduced myself. I'm going to introduce the Paradox Basin. Can everyone see my screen clearly? Yes, it is clear, yeah. Okay, and yeah. can you see my laser pointer as well? Yeah. All right, good. So the way this will work is I'll introduce the Paradox Basin and then I will take you guys there just, just as I do my regular field trips. We'll fly out to the Paradox Basin We'll look at different things. We'll start big. So we'll look at seismic scale architecture. Then we'll look at smaller features on a log scale. And then I will do a brief discussion of fluvial classification and fluvial analogs. And then we'll finally talk about the Gharif. Now, before I get into it, I'll be the first person to admit that I have no experience with the Gharif whatsoever. Okay, so I have never worked in Oman. I have never been to Oman. I've never looked at the Gharif outcrops. So, so why are we doing this then? You know, if I've never looked at the Gharif, why am I taking you on a field trip to the Paradox Basin? Well, in oil and gas, there's a famous saying. They say that either you can take new eyes and put them on an old basin, or you can take a pair of old eyes and put them on a new basin to maximize your learning. So I think today I will be giving you a very unbiased view of how similar depositional systems work in other settings, which is why we're going to the Paradox Basin. So the yeah. first thing is flying to yes. the Paradox Basin. So if you are in Oman, you will most likely take a flight to somewhere in Europe. So either a flight to Frankfurt in Germany or uh, maybe a flight before, a flight to... before we fly, uh, just I want to comment for the audience that uh, after we land, then they can ask in the chat, uh, then we will have the discussion with you. So just uh, listen and enjoy the flight, and then we will meet at the end of the uh, presentation. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's so, good idea. So I will mute and I will close my cam. It's yours now. All right, all right. Thank you, thank you, Ali. So, anyways, we so before you come to the U.S. to the Paradox Basin, like I said, you have to connect somewhere in Europe, and then what you would do is you would land in Denver, which is where I'm at right now. I'm uh, this is where I'm at. I'm in Colorado, 
giving you this talk. And then from Denver, you would be taking a flight to Moab, which is in Utah. And the first thing you realize when you're flying into Moab is just the view, the sheer expanse of the landscape. Everything is very barren. The geology is just out there for you to see. You can see these beautiful lineaments right here, these fracture patterns right before we land at Moab Airport. So let's talk, give you guys some background on what the Paradox Basin is. So it's a basin that is located mainly in Utah, parts of it are in Colorado, and then a little bit of it extends into New Mexico. And during the Pennsylvanian time, there was an uplift in this area. Okay, so it's a foreland basin setting, there's an uplift going on. And in that foreland basin, we had a fairly restricted seaway. So what we are doing is we are accumulating a lot of evaporites. Okay, and when I say a lot of evaporites, we're talking about over three kilometers of evaporite deposition in that basin. And as these mountains, this as an uncompagre uplift as it's called, as it keep, keeps uplifting, it starts shedding sediments into the basin. So the salt in pink, that is part of the paradox formation. And as you keep depositing sediments on top, the, sediment, the salt reacts to the sedimentation. It starts moving, okay? Now, already you can see why we're doing this. So as, as soon as I, while I'm talking about this stuff, what I want you to do is I want you to think about your own basin and your own reservoir. So when I think about paradox salt, you should be thinking about the ara salt. And when I th start talking about formations like the Cutler, I want you to be thinking about the Gharif and how they're, how it plays out. So anyways, we start with the deposition of the paradox. Then we start depositing mixed carbonate clastics from these marine rocks. We start getting into a regression and we start depositing terrestrial rocks. And when, we, when I say terrestrial rocks, more specifically, we're gonna be talking about fluvial depositional systems. And then we have quite a few different fluvial depositional systems in this basin that we're gonna compare. So that is, that is the setting. We're in a foreland basin with a lot of salt and the salt is moving because of sedimentation. So the first day when you arrive in the field, we take you on an overview just because the geology is so spectacular. It takes a little bit for everything to sink in. The outcrops are very large. The continuity of depositional systems is for tens of kilometers. Why is, that, why is that important? Well, the beauty of looking at these rocks in the Paradox Basin is you start from the mountain front. So you look in at the alluvial fans being shed by this uncompagre uplift. And as you go distal, you go from the alluvial fans to these distributary, distributary fluvial systems until finally you get to the marine systems. And the, and the entire system, the, all the facies tracks are actually preserved. Okay, that is the beauty of being able to do work in the Paradox Basin, which is why we get geoscientists from all over the world showing up here to look at the geology. Now, these folks are, uh, this was on a field trip that we led for a company called Neptune Energy and their partners. So it was Neptune Energy and a few other companies from Norway that we were leading on a field trip. This is our, our salt tectonics expert, Dr. Carl Mueller, leading the field trip for this particular day. Now, for those of you who are familiar with salt tectonics, there is a very famous model of this thing called an expulsion rollover. The way an expulsion rollover works is you've got some salt and you start depositing sediment on one side and as that sediment prograts, it starts pushing the salt in one direction. And that is what we have in the Paradox Basin. So in the blue is the salt, in the pink is the basement. And you can see that here we've just deposited some carbonates on top of the salt, but this is where the clastic sedimentation comes in. And as soon as that clastic set influx is coming in, it's pushing the salt away from the mountain range. And as it does that, 
the soul, soul starts reacting, the soul starts moving, we've got halokinesis. And what happens is if you look, all these little nicks that you see, those are basement faults. Every time the salt moves, it interacts with those basement core faults and the salt rises up as a wall. And we keep doing this and we create mini basins and we create one wall and then a second wall and a third wall. And these walls get taller and taller as sediments keep filling into this basin. So when you're looking at this, what I want you to think about is a very similar situation at home with the salt moving in reaction to the sediment, plastic sediment influx into that area. So this is what we're looking at. It's whatever you see, the, the, our, the large scale basin scales or seismic scale architecture of the salt is in response to the sediments, but then the sediment architecture is in response to the salt. So you can't separate the two. The, the, two, are, the two go hand in hand. Okay, and uh, this was a field trip we led for Shell, and you can see one of the geoscientists taking a picture of the salt, which is in this case, it has a gypsum cap, which is why it's looking dark gray. But in the back, you can see the fluvial deposits, the Cutler group in red. All right, so here we are. We are in the Paradox Basin. And right now, what you're looking at is one of these salt walls. Okay, so this is, a, this is everything you see over here. That is the salt body. And on top, this feature is actually a mini basin. All right, so you've got this mini basin sitting right here. So what's happened is you had fluvial deposits moving across the surface of the salt. And as those fluvial deposits moving around, not only are they eroding into the salt, they are loading into the salt. And as they load, they, ca they cause the salt to move. So here you can see the mini basin. And here's an example. This is actually from uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And it's from a publication. And you can see a very similar geometry over here. Of course, this is on a much larger scale than what you're looking at over here. Okay, this is, you can see the scale here is two kilometers. Whereas in here, this is about one fourth of that size. So it's, it's much smaller, but it's, this, it's a similar sort of feature. So it's a great place to be able to look at these salt sediment interactions. Now, as soon as one of these guys fills, then the next step is it's gonna spill. And although these fill and spill models have been around for a while, you know, since the 1990s, and they've been refined by, by many people, including my, my friend Vishal Maharaj, we did his PhD on this stuff. This is from his uh, dissertation, okay? Most of these fill and spill models are actually made for submarine systems, okay? So places like the Gulf of Mexico, or in this particular case, this is from Indonesia. And uh, these are, these are actually, this is actually not salt. In this case, these are mud diapirs. But again, the diapirism is controlling the geometry of these deep water sands. It's controlling the straddle architecture of how these things fill and spill in these mini basins. And, this, and what you see over here is, again, the gray is all evaporite. That's all the salt. And then this is a channel, which is something like this, okay? It's, it's the entry point going from one mini basin to another mini basin, and it's connecting the two. So fantastic place to be able to see these architectures in outcrop. The other thing that is beautiful about the Paradox Basin is the fact that everything is bare and everything is very, very large, okay? So everything is on seismic scale, which means oftentimes when you are sitting on your workstation and you are interpreting data and you're looking at seismic, you're like, you're wondering, you're like, okay, why, why am I seeing these features. Once you're at the outcrop, you can relate what you see in seismic to what's causing that particular response. So let's take a look at the edge first. And the edge, you can see that this stuff is actually nicely bedded, okay? And because it's nicely bedded, you've got, you're generating impedance contrast between the sand layers and the mudstone layers. And that generates reflections that you can actually interpret in your seismic data. 
as soon as you get into the salt, well, that's fairly homogeneous. And because it is fairly homogeneous, there's very little internal impedance contrast, which is why it appears to be seismically transparent, which is why when you look at this seismic line, you can see two distinct seismic facies. You can see that the mini basin is being filled by these fairly continuous variable amplitude reflections. Whereas outside the mini basin, when you're looking at the salt, that is seismically transparent, or some, you know, some people would call it chaotic, but two very distinct seismic facies. And you can see that contact. So this contact between the layered stuff and the stuff which is not layered, you can see that contact right here between the red and the gray. The gray again being the, being the salt, and then the red being the sedimentary rocks. In this case, they're not in the mini basin. In this case, they happen to be right along the margins of that salt wall. Now, what we, what we realize is, you know, a lot of times you guys are interpreting data on your workstations, you're looking at seismic, and there's a, huge, there's a huge scale contrast because even if I take you there and I put you in front of the outcrop, you can see small, small features, but we want you to be able to see everything on the same scale, so on seismic scale, okay? So the best way to do that is we chartered these airplanes, we put everyone on the field trip in these airplanes, and then we fly you over this stuff. And when we fly you over the stuff, then you get a much better view. And although I know most of you are working for Metco Energy, maybe from for a few other oil and gas companies, so I know the focus here is oil and gas. But one of the things that I'm hoping you leave today with is a realization that when you've got a lot of salt in a basin with a thick succession of red beds, not only is it, is it good for oil and gas, but it has a lot of mining potential as well. In this particular case, what you're looking at here are these solution pools by a company that's drilling into the salt itself for potash. You know, potash is, a, is used in the fertilizer industry. And uh, when you've got diapirs like this, in some cases, they can be potash rich. So that's something to look into, but that's what you're looking at here. These guys mine into the, pot, into the salt. They inject hot water. The hot water dissolves the salt. It comes back up. And then they'll let the, that, that water, that solution out into these pans and it evaporates because it's super dry out there. And then you have, then people just go up and scoop up the potash. Okay, so it's a solution mining operation for potash. That's what you're seeing. But of course, I know most of you are in oil and gas. So when you're flying in one of these chartered airplanes that we get, man, that is, that is, that is almost like flying over a seismic horizon slice, okay? Because now you get to see everything in map view and everything is seismic scale. So what you're looking at right here is a diapir, okay? This one is known as a upheaval dome. And you can see that the core has all that salt, all the gray that you're seeing, all that is, is gypsum. And then you can see the geometry of the beds that are onlapping against that diapir. You can see all of them over here. So it's, a, it's, it's one hell of an experience. And once you've seen it like this and then you go back to your seismic, it makes a lot more sense, okay? So we've talked a, a, bit, a little bit about the salt and halokinesis, but now I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the effect of halokinesis, which is salt movement, on large scale alluvial architecture. Now, when I mean large scale alluvial architecture, I don't mean channel scale or channel belt scale. I'm talking about basin scale alluvial architecture. And what happens is, as we're depositing these fluvial sediments on top of the salt, they are slowly deforming. Why? Because the salt is moving and that's what you're seeing in this picture. These layers were horizontal to start with, but what we're doing is as, this, as the substrate, which is the salt is subsiding, these beds are getting tilted, which means when we, de when we deposit additional fluvial strata on top, what you often end up getting are these angular unconformities, which is what you're seeing over here. 
So can you, you can see these beds that are angular. That's what you're looking at over here, okay? So these beds would be the, would, are the same as that, okay? That's just an interpretation. So this picture was taken right outside Moab and that's what's happening. So internally within the fluvial package, oftentimes when people are interpreting fluvial packages and they're like, oh, we're looking at a sequence boundary or a very large basin scale unconformity. Normally when people see that, what they will do is they will interpret that, that unconformity to have been created because of some sort of climate change. But in this case, what I want you to keep in mind is that it doesn't have to be because of climate change. In basins where you have a mobile substrate such as salt, you can get these local unconformities. Okay, you can get these local unconformities. Sometimes they can be basin scale just because of salt movement. Now, besides creating those angular unconformities, what else is going on? Well, you have to remember that in the paradox, we've got multiple stages of fluvial deposition going on over the salt. Now, some of these layers, some of the fluvial deposits were interacting with the salt directly. Okay, uh, an example of that were some of the slides I showed you earlier that were from the Cutler group. Now we're getting into stuff which is a little bit younger, but guess what? Just because they're younger doesn't mean that the salt is not moving. The salt is still moving. Why? Because the salt is reacting to the load that you're putting on top of it. And as you're loading more, more and more sediment on top, these salt walls tend to get higher and higher. And as these salt walls are growing and these mini basins are subsiding, you are creating topography that these fluvial systems now have to interact with. Here's an example. You've got these different salt walls that are coming up and on the surface, they're forming these ridges. Okay, so what do, what do these fluvial systems have to do? Well, these fluvial systems, their architecture is being dictated by the topography that's being generated by these rising ridges. And that's what you're seeing in this Shinley formation. Okay, so yes, if you've got a well right here, and someone looks at it, they're like, oh yeah, I'm looking at point bars. It's a high sinuosity system. Well, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. That's what you're looking at on a log scale, but on a very large scale, on a basin scale, you have to be very careful that alluvial architecture is changing because of the topography being generated by halokinesis, okay? And it changes at every level. Why is that important? Well, that's important because I'm gonna go back a few slides. You, what you cannot do is create some fluvial models of basin scale fluvial architecture using this system that is sitting directly on top of the salt and then apply it to systems that are not directly interacting with the salt but were deposited much later, okay? So that is, that is something to keep in mind that as time goes by, alluvial architecture is changing in response to this mobile substrate. Now, overall, what is happening in the basin? Now we're not gonna talk, we're gonna move slightly away from the salt sediment interaction. We're just gonna focus specifically on the depositional system going a little bit more smaller scale. So overall, we are in a regression. We started off with marine strata that are carbonate rich. And then we had a regression and we're getting into these continental red beds, okay? And different kinds of alluvial systems, sorry, fluvial systems that were deposited initially as alluvial fans and the system prograded. Then we have a whole series of distributed fluvial systems and we're gonna talk about some of those. Okay, but overall, what I want you to remember is that we're going from marine rocks to terrestrial rocks as we are continuing this regression. So this is one of the most classic places in the world to take a look at what are called distributary fluvial systems. Okay, these are not alluvial fans, they're different, but they are distributary in nature. 
or why is it important? It's important because as you're moving away from the sediment source, your net to gross is decreasing fairly drastically. Okay, so we're, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you to these places. I'm gonna take you here at the most proximal part and let's take a look at the net, net to gross at that particular location. So let me get rid of my mouse so I can actually click. All right, let's see. All right, so I'm gonna click on the proximal part so you can see what it actually looks like. All right, so this is what it looks like. All right, I'm gonna wait because I think there's a little bit of a lag time. So I'm gonna wait till the FDRB and now you guys can see it. So I'm gonna show you around with the lag time. Uh, this is not working as well as I thought it would, but we'll go, we'll go nice and slow just so you guys get a sense of what's going on. All right, we're gonna, like I said, we just have to be a little bit more patient because there is a lag time of a few seconds. So I keep moving this image on my screen and it takes a little bit for you guys to see it. But anyways, let's stop there. I want you to look at this face and what you're seeing from the bottom, you can see that girl on the outcrop for scale. You can see from the bottom to the top, man, that is all amalgamated fluvial channels. That is 100% net to gross right there. It's pretty much, there's very, very little mudstone in that system. Okay, so this is what happens when you're very proximal in one of these distributedly fluvial systems. Now let's look at the middle part. I'm gonna go click on this and then let's see what happens. All right, again, there is a little bit of a lag time here, so please uh, bear with me. All right, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna move this around nice and slow. Hopefully Zoom catches this sometime soon. All right, this is taking longer than I expected it would, but you know, these are the joys of doing a, doing a virtual tour versus the, versus the real thing. So let's give it a little bit more. Yeah. At least you get a sense of what these outcrops are like. All right, so this is this uh, the, the, this whole um, outcrop photo thing is not working too well, but that's okay. What I want you to notice here is that we've decreased we, we've decreased net to gross significantly. Okay, we went from being almost ninety five to hundred percent net to gross, and we're now about twenty kilometers from the source, and we're down to maybe sixty percent net to grow. So it's, it's, it's decreasing significantly. And I'm not, I'm not gonna click on the last one because like I said, it's not, it's not working as, as well as I thought it would. But I, you'll just have to take my word for it and you'll just have to look at the cross section on your, on your screen. And what you can see is hopefully once this, once this actually shows up, All right, there we go. All right, so once it shows up, you can see that again, net to gross decreases significantly once you're even further away. So when we're looking, when we're about another, I'd say 15, 20 kilometers from that last location that I showed you, 
now we're getting into net to gross 20 to 30%. So net to gross is decreasing quite a bit. And this is a pattern in these distributory fluvial systems. Now let's look at the next one. Okay, so now we're still looking at some of these fluvial successions in the basin. And uh, now we're going even smaller scale. So we started with seismic scale. We talked about the salt and the interaction of fluvial sediments with the salt. Then we talked about net to gross and I showed you a whole bunch of stratigraphic sections that was at well log scale. And you can see how facies tracks are changing as you go further away from the source. You're getting much less net to gross and also the architecture is changing. Now we're gonna talk more about the borehole image log or the core scale of this system. Okay, so the first thing you see is everything you're looking at is very, very red. Okay, it's very red. In this particular case, uh, one of the reasons why it's red is it's, it's highly oxidized, lots of iron minerals in the system, and they're all fluctuate between being arid to semi-arid to going into subhumid. There's a picture of the Shinli, and in this particular picture, which uh, I guess we'll have to wait so you guys can see it. Like I said, there's a bit of, bit of lag time. All right, there we go. Now you can see the Shinley formation, which is one of the more subhumid units in this case. Again, like I said, most of you I know are focused on oil and gas, but you know, because this talk is for the Geological Society of Oman, I think the one thing you should be aware of is anywhere in the world where we've got thick salt bodies and then we have red beds on top, that's the recipe to get sediment hosted copper deposits. And that's what you're looking at in this picture. So all the green stuff that you're seeing on this bed, which is the base of a channel, that is all the green stuff is malachite which is a copper mineral. The blue that you see on top, that is azurite. So both of those are actually copper minerals. So whenever you get this combination of red beds on top of salt, uh, that's, a, that's a good sign. It's a, it tells you that you should also go look for copper. Besides copper in the basin, we have these brines coming up. And in the Shinley formation, in the next picture, you should see some banding on these overbank sandstones. So hopefully that slide should have opened up soon. Boom, there we go. So these bands that you're seeing, that is actually uranium and vanadium. Okay, so we get uranium and vanadium in the Paradox Basin as well. So again, the reason I'm showing you this stuff is it is a geological society meeting and uh, maybe there's some of you that are interested in mining. So that's something to keep in mind. Getting back to fluvial systems on a core scale, what I want you to focus on next is what kind of sedimentary structures we're getting, because that will lead us into fluvial classification and hopefully some lessons that you can import back to the Gharif. So here you can see a, a fairly symmetric fluvial channel, and that fluvial channel is cutting into sheet sands. Okay, so these sheet sands are fairly tabular. They're not very channel-like. They occur when we have flash floods in a, in a semi-arid environment and they're associated with ephemeral streams, okay? Here's, a, here's another outcrop. This is from the Cayenta Formation, also in the Paradox Basin. And what you're looking at are called overturned cross stratification. And what they represent is exist, increasing shear on existing bed forms, again, rapid pulses in, in flow velocity, okay? And that's, so what I want you to be taking away from, this sli from these slides is we're not talking about a river that is flowing almost at the same discharge all year round. What I'm showing you examples of are sedimentary structures that are produced during what we called upper flow regime, okay? So very high energy events. Okay, so imagine that there's either no water in a stream or there's very little water in a stream and then there's a flash flood and everything is going down the channel at very high velocities, some oftentimes with 
a lot of bed, a lot of bed load. And what you're looking at in this picture is an antidone. Okay, this is it's it's this feature up here. Let me get my let me get my laser pointer back up so you can actually see it. There you go. There's my laser pointer. All right. So this this hump-like feature that is an antidone, and I'll tell you what, when you, when you take your first sedimentology or stratigraphy class in college, they tell you that, you know what? These upper flow regime sedimentary structures, you're not, you're, you'll never see them. Yes, they're supposed to be there, but you'll never see them because what happens is they're followed by erosion. And so they have very low preservation potential. And I would agree, they do have very little preservation potential, but they do exist and they are in, in streams like this that are characterized by high discharge variability, these actually are much more common than your typical large scale macroforms like point bars and unit bars, okay? So let's look at some more. Uh, not as cool as the antidune, but what you're looking at in this slide, which should pop up here any second, All right, we're still waiting. All right, I apologize about the about the lag time today. Usually, it's not it's not as bad, but I guess it's because we're pretty darn far, and the weather outside is horrible right now. It's like negative six degrees Fahrenheit in Colorado right now outside my house. But anyways, here you're looking at upper stage plane beds. Again, the reason I'm making a big deal about this folks is usually when you go and you look at a, at a fluvial outcrop, it's just cross bedding, cross bedding and more cross bedding. And then you see beautifully preserved point bar deposits and you see beautiful unit bars that are made up of, of, of that cross bedding. But to go out there and see these fluvial successions that are dominated by these upper flow regime sedimentary structures, that's different. And that's, that's really telling you something. So I wanna back up and now switch gears. I've showed you a whole bunch of fluvial systems in the Paradox Basin today. I showed you examples from the Oregon Rock Formation, which is part of the Coupler Group. Remember, we have the Paradox Formation, which is the salt. Right on, the, on top of the salt, we have carbonates. After the carbonates, we have a clastic succession, which is mainly fluvial. And then I showed you several examples of fluvial systems. We started with the organ rock formation. Uh, then we looked at the Moenkopi, the Shinli, and the Kayana. And what do all of these fluvial systems have in common? Well, they are all distributary fluvial systems, okay? So they all form these basin scale fan-like geometries, okay? And depending on what their gradient is like, what the sediment supply is like, what the discharge is like, they can have different geometries internally, okay? But overall, they form these distributively fluvial systems. Now, back in the day when pe people used to look at fluvial systems, it was, you know, there was really one classification scheme out there, which was the classification scheme put forth by Andy Mile and you know, you would just look at architectural element analysis. And the reason I bring this up is because most of the stuff in the published domain that I've looked at for the Garif is taking a similar approach. It's, it's looking at some of the outcrops, some of the core from the Garif, using the mild classification scheme. And uh, then it's like, all right, you know, the, the Garif rep represents Saskatchewan style fluvial deposits. And that's okay, that's not, it's not a bad approach. It is a bit dated, okay? So we have, we have other approaches we can look at. And one of those approaches, which is super useful, is this approach that uses discharge variability, which is how variable is the discharge in a stream? Because that tells you a lot, not only about the alluvial architecture, but about plant form geometries as well, okay? So most of, the, most of the systems that I've showed you in the paradox, they're across the board. But what I would highly encourage you to do, whether you're working on the Garif or any other fluvial succession in the world, I know a lot of you are from, um, are from Metco Energy. A lot of you have assets in Indonesia. And, and I can tell you, the, 
this already that even if you're applying this to the reservoirs in Indonesia, when you're looking at fluvial systems, you have to look at a few different things. The, one of them is the sedimentary structures and what they tell you about discharge variability. Okay, because a lot of the stuff when we're looking at semi arid systems like the Gharif, like what we saw in the Paradox Basin, especially in the, in the Oregon Rock Formation or in the Cayenne, those are these high, very high discharge variance systems. Okay, so they have, they behave very differently than something that, that does not have that sort of discharge variance. So that's, that's one filter you need to put. The second filter that I strongly recommend is I've seen, again, I've never been to the Gharif. Everything I'm going off of is what's in the published literature. And when you look at pictures, everything looks super red. Everything points towards a fairly semi-arid setting. Now, one thing to keep, another filter to put on these fluvial systems when you're looking at them in detail is not just what's in the channel. I know we're oil and gas folks, so what we like to do is we like to core where the sand is. But unfortunately, the climatic signature isn't really preserved in the sandstone. It's actually preserved in the overbank deposits. So we're talking about paleosols and what the paleosols are telling us. And that's where the climatic signature is. So again, the reason I brought this up is because while doing my homework before giving this presentation over the past few months, when I'm looking at a lot of the stuff that's been published or presented on the reef, you know, it's examples of, okay, take a look at this fluvial system. This is what it looks like on the East Coast of the US. And I'm, and I'm looking at it and it's, like, it's a picture of a channel. And you know, these channels are going into a lake and it's super green all around. And I'm like, you know what? That's not what an arid system looks like. And so again, it's, it's something to keep in mind. It's something very important. I mean, paleoclimate makes a huge difference. Now let's talk about the Gharif itself. So why, am I sh why did I walk you through this whole thing? Well, I walked you through this whole thing for a few different reasons. Well, first of all, like the Cutler group in the Paradox Basin, we are looking at an overall regression going from marine rocks at the base. And not only are they marine rocks, they're fairly, you know, we're going from carbonate rich marine rocks like the Hauschie limestone. And we're getting into this terrestrial succession, which is represented by primarily you know, a fluvial system. And within that, you have several internal hiatus. Okay, that's one of the reasons. The second reason is, like the paradox, you are in an asymmetric foreland basin with a fairly thick salt, salt body on which you're depositing all these strata. And as you're depositing these strata, of course, the salt is going to react. You know, you're going to get halokinesis because of sediment loading. And so some of the lessons that we've learned from the paradox can be applied to what you're seeing in the subsurface in Oman. That was the, that was a rationale for walking you through. The other lesson that I hoped you learned is the Gharif represents 26 million years of deposition. What that means is if you create a fluvial model for a part, a small part of the middle of the reef, that would, that would certainly be inapplicable to other parts of the reef. Why? For two different reasons. First of all, the climate is changing. It may be going from temperate to arid. The second thing is happening, the topography is no longer the same. The topography that fluvial systems in the, in the earlier part of the middle of the reef encountered is very different than the topography that fluvial systems in the upper reef would have to interact with. And, I, and ho I'm hoping by now, through the examples that I've showed you, you do have an appreciation of how much paleotopography or the topography at time of deposition dictates large scale alluvial architecture. Looking at, um, at a depositional model like this, I, I do want to draw something on it real quick just for you. If I take this, and I draw a distributary fluvial system on it, which is what you get in most parts of the world when you've got a foreland basin. And if we do something like this, if you ignore the interpretation that this person has made on top, in cross-sectional view, 
what you're seeing right here fits perfectly with a distributedly fluvial system succession, okay? Which means everything comes together over here. We've got high net to gross in this portion. As you move further away, these sand bodies get more and more disconnected and we get into lower net to gross. Also the alluvial style changes, we get into more sheet flood deposits out here versus amalgamated channels over there. That's just a, that's just a side note. Of course, that's something for you guys to test out. Okay, so let me get rid of this. All right. Now, what are some other take takeaway lessons? I'm gonna wrap this up real quick, just a few more slides. Another take home lesson is that you should expect drastic changes in net to gross over short distances. Well, why is that? Well, let's look at, this is that mini basin I showed you guys earlier. Let's look at the thickness of the sandstone package in the mini basin. And let's compare that with the sandstone package right here. Okay, and this is not, this is not that far apart. We're talking about less than five kilometers right there. Okay, this is much thicker than what you're getting on top of the salt right there. So these drastic thickness changes are common. The other change that's that's super common are drastic changes in net to gross over short distances. You know, I tried to show you those outcrop photos, those interactive outcrop photos that didn't work too well, but again, this is what it looks like when you're very close to the apex of that distributory fluvial system and uh, everything is amalgamated over here. You move a few kilometers away and that net to gross goes down significantly. So what are some recommendations? Well, again, this, because this is over an overall geoscience talk, basins with thick successions of salt not only have potential for hydrocarbon in, entrapment, but you have to look at other, other mineral resources as well, especially if you've got thick salt and then a thick succession of red beds on top, and that is, a, that is the perfect recipe to get sediment-hosted copper. Fluvial successions like the Garif with large permineralized wood can also host uranium. And I have seen pictures of several examples of petrified wood from the Garif, so that's something to look at. Diapirs can be host not only for halite, but for potash as well. So I know we're geared towards oil and gas, but these are some other things to think about just, just for the overall economy of Oman. And then the final thing I'll leave you with is that fluvial successions are very, very complicated. So per personally, wherever that fluvial succession may be, whether it's a Garif in Oman or any other fluvial system anywhere else in the world, I like to look at basin scale architecture, which is why I talked about distributary, distributary fluvial systems with you today. Then looking at channel belt scale facies associations, which is why I showed you all those examples of those upper flow regime bed forms. And then finally, paleoclimate from overbank finds. So when you do come up with an analog or you do come up with a model, that should make sense because um, like I said, a, a lot of the models that I've seen in the published literature or on, uh, in presentations given on the reef online they show something which would work super well for a temperate to a humid climate uh, with a lot of rainfall, a very wet environment. And, um, and that may not be ideal for a system like the Gharif with, uh, with so many red beds. All right. So I'm hoping this talk was somewhat useful. And if it is, we are on LinkedIn. We've got an Applied Stratigraphics company page. We are on YouTube. Most of these webinars that we give, we later upload on our YouTube channel where you can access a bunch of these webinars for free. Not only are the webinars by myself, but for, uh, you know, there are a lot of them are videos that have been uploaded by, by my team, which are more structural geology or shale focused. And then of course, you know, we try to get with the times and we do have a Facebook page so bottom line is please stay in touch. Uh, I will try, I will take your questions now, but if there's anything that you think of in a few days from now or a few months from now, please do not hesitate to reach out and contact me.